as you can see from your program, this small section right before we go to lunch uh, begins a conversation on the identity of Pax Christi in the Asia Pacific region. Um, this will be a, a piece of it first, looking at uh, what we already know and, and what uh, we sense is the reality, and then tomorrow we'll share a lot more about um, where we are going and, um, and uh, how our conversations thus far uh, will impact that. So um, thank you for your patience as we jump right into uh, the conversation again. Great uh, is going to begin this section by doing a brief report on uh, where Pax Christi International has been on uh, in relation to in the Asia Pacific region. Hello. Hello everybody. Hello. So we're entering a new phase. Uh, which is an important phase for Pax Christi National, the International Secretariat, after listening to all these um, quite in intensive contributions and analysis and uh, talking about what, uh, what you are doing. So we now are entering into hmm, what does it mean for Pax Christi, yeah, as Marie is saying. And we thought it's, it's first, before we enter in that conversation, to give you an overview of the role of Paxi, the Secretariat, the role of International Secretariat, what you call Brussels, and also um, about um, what has already been done as ex thinking about a possible regionalization of Pax Christi in the Asia Pacific. So, Pax Christi International has been engaged in a comprehensive organizational development process since 2011 and this was done by key players in the movement. The leaders of the sections, board members, key people of member organizations and so on. And an important element of that was to identify the core areas of responsibility of the International Secretariat in Brussels. And even the question was put at that time, do you need an International Secretariat in Brussels? And the result of that exercise was yes, yes, we need one. And then we went to identifying the roles. And these are the four core areas, areas of responsibility that have been identified by our members. You have the networking, which facilitate growth and integration of the international movement. The advocacy element is to coordinate and represent the breadth of the global movement on the international stage. The fourth is capacity building, build capacity of member organizations for nonviolent peace work and peace spirituality articulate and develop the network's commitment to peace, spirituality and active non-violence. So these are the roles that the members have told us that we should fulfill these roles. Now you know that we have 120 member organizations all over the world and for a small secretariat in Brussels to fulfill all these roles, that, that can, uh, only a miracle can do that. So we have been thinking what's, what what are the processes and how can we fulfill that role? And of course it needs to be, the, well the first phase we were thinking about is that we, need, that we need to have a good idea about the capacities of our members because the international movement doesn't exist without the members and we can't do these roles without the members. So um, I think the next, uh, yeah, so the first thing we did was capacity mapping and that was done about three years ago by the former Secretary General Jose, who sent to you about 108 questions um, uh, to all our members, the 120 member organizations. So also our members in the Asia Pacific and there are 18 members in the Asia Pacific. It's good to know that um, half of them answered. So it's important to look at your results. So uh, the um, I think you have to go back. The, the second phase was uh, uh, yeah uh, to identify and analyze its collective capacity to promote a just and lasting peace. Then 
we went to another, uh, the next phase. So once this mapping was done, of which I'll report it later on, the third phase was to uh, focus on strengthening the Pax Christi global network through a regionalization process and ways to do that. And while thinking about that, these were the conditions which came also out of the mapping in order to have a functional global international network you need functional sub-regional networks special attention needs to be given to local expertise role of regional actors is essential Pro -pro programmatic priorities emerge from regional experiences and priorities are implemented according to regional context this is also this was already a result of the mapping process we have done and we have taken this very seriously and that's why we are organizing these regional consultations and this consultation is is part of that thinking now result of the mapping of the member organization so some of you have already heard this report especially the section it was quite a complicated report a technical report and I'm now trying to make a summary of it in an understandable way. Um, when you go to the next slide, uh, the purpose of the mapping was to gain valuable knowledge about peace capacities of the Pax Christi and all. Member organizations are both affiliated members and sections. And to highlight existing strengths, to explore potential alliances and opportunities for peace work. A second purpose was to try to start a reflection process about strategic development of Pax Christi networks and in this case it's about the Asia Pacific. Now for those who, are, who don't understand very well our membership, I know it has been confusing in the past, but also in the organizational development process we clarify this much more better. The international movement has three types of membership and in the Asia Pacific we only have two. We have sections, Pax Vista Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, who are actually accepted by the General Assembly and they constitute the core membership. We have about 18 Pax Vista sections in the whole movement. The second type of membership are affiliated members. And these are organizations that keep their own name. And there are quite a bit of members here in this room. They are not organized as an expression of Pax Christi, even though they might have a national, even regional constituency. And they are formally accepted by the board. They don't have voting rights, uh, these affiliated members. So we no longer talk about partners or associated members or affiliated organization. It's all gone. It's sections or affiliated members. What is not existing in the Asia Pacific are the uh, Pax Christi groups. And groups are uh, small groups which exist in a city, for instance. People who come together, it could be 10 or 15 people, who work as Pax Christi. And then we call them uh, Pax Christi Putembo, for instance, in the Congo, or Pax Christi Paho Prince. So, but in Asia Pacific, we don't have these small local entities. You, it might be that Pax Christi Australia or Pax Christi New Zealand have little groups in your country, but that's not what we are talking about. So, okay, so, result. Now, the questions about the mapping were mainly they were, the inquiry looked at organizational features and also the peace building work you do and also what could be a possible preference of an Asia Pacific network. So th the questions were focused on that. The first questions had to do with resources planning, culture and engagement. And what we can see is that the most important conclusion is that the level of resources allow for a significant level of action within the context, which means that, um, for instance, your economic, your economic situation, some of you um, work with projects, programs, 
others don't work with projects, programs, but even if you have the money, yes or no, there is a good, um, there is a very good um, level, a significant level to work on peace. And some only work with volunteers, for instance, but they work, do very good work on peace. But also the planning. Some have a very good uh, planning culture because of projects and programs they are doing, because they are funded. So they have plannings for three, five years. They have a very good uh, plan for monitoring and evaluation. Very well worked. Others don't do this kind of thing. They don't have projects or funded programs. But there, there is still a good planning culture within the movement. It's important to know that if you want to work together as a network. And the third one is that um, there's really a high level of transparency, participation and democracy in the way you as member organizations work with regard to your board or with your assembly. It might be that you're experiencing problems, but these problems are, um, are um, real or dealt with. It's not that they are hidden. No, so it's really a, a culture of working together and a democratic culture, which is also important looking at future development of networks. Uh, when you go to values, when we ask that question, there were three values which are highly uh, prior prioritized. The vision for community social change, Christian values, and the vision for political change. When you go to the working clusters, we call it, what we see is that the results of the mapping give an, um, an indication um, that advocacy for peace and human rights is highly rated. And by that we mean by advocacy bringing teams to national or the local level, public pressure for issues related to conflict, lobby for civil society involvement in peace negotiation and so on and this we uh, and this we call it the cluster conflict transformation the second one was in group socialization towards peace and democracy and that is the cluster of peace education the third one was protection of citizens against violence from all parties and facilitation of dialogue which is a cluster of conflict prevention we had disarmament on the list of questions as a separate as a separate element because it's quite important in the movement but there I've seen a major difference between the response of affiliated members and the Pasquisti sections. Pasquisti sections rated this very high on their agenda. Affiliated members said no we don't work on that. That was one of the few main differences which I've seen in, in this mapping. And then, of course, reconciliation was also rated by all of you as important for the work to do. Um, when you go to beneficiaries, there was a bit of a mix there. Eh? Our member organizations are so, are so different. So some, there are some who answered that their peace actions have been directed to as many people as possible without any selective criteria. Others said, no, 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 we only have individuals as beneficiaries, and these are mainly local, local uh, community-based organizations. But most of the members said that they support a group of beneficiaries that is larger and distinct from their own members. So that's, that's a little bit where they work. And some of them also said, no, no, we target other organizations or collective actors. So you can see there is a bit of a mix within the movement. Then with regard to advocacy development, we put that also as a separate question because it's an important role of Pax Christi International. And based on the result, it is important to highlight that most are advocacy aware and they have done uh, carried out national or regional advocacy initiatives for peace over the last several years, directly or indirectly. As far as I know, none have a consultative status at the UN, and unless there has been a change. And what was a bit surprising for us is that uh, not many were aware of the consultative status at the UN and other intergovernmental organizations of Pax International. 
which was a bit of a surprise because it means that um, this is something we haven't been communicating about um, very clearly. Now when you come to linkages between member sections and others, um, when you look at the, a basic network which we have designed, we see that there's a very limited linkages present among all of you, especially the affiliated members. The results seem that there are almost no linkages. There are linkages between the affiliated members and some sections that exist, but one could say that could we talk about the network right now, if there are connections? The result showed no, it's a very limited. But what is a true, what, what we could see is that um, many have relations with other networks in the region and when you go to the next slide, there you see the responses they have given. So, and on this list there are a few member organizations who are not even there. But you can see that, oh, well, they have good connections, but among themselves, very little. So, uh, but this chart also shows what possibility there is within the network of Pax Christi. All of you have very important relationships with network of organizations or campaigns. So, but the interconnectedness is not there. Now, when you go to the next slide, um, among the goals of the mapping was that um, we should start a conversation about what possible coordination mechanism would be okay or would be possible for Pax Christi regions and especially for in this case the Asia Pacific and when we see what the there too are so a little bit of a difference there are three types of networks which you have indicated as preference and the first one was networks organized around an advocacy campaign and this was the highest choice of our affiliated members, not of the sections. This was our affiliated members. Look at Pax Christi International for advocacy. When you look at sections, they put the second one as the most important one. Networks or grant issues affecting a specific geographical area. And then you had a third one, networks organized around sharing knowledge on a global team. When you look at it and its whole, you can see that these three types of networks seem to seem to, to be something that uh, we could think about in the Asia Pacific region. Um, but the roles and functions are concerned, um, and most expectations for a Pax Christi Asia Pacific net, the, the, the survey result shows that MOs, well, there's a preference for an amplifying function of the network, learning and facilitation with a special focus on support members' general ex organizational capacity development, a network that could facilitate members' exchanges, and a network that helps to define a common position that can be communicated externally. These were the highly rated. What was also important, a convener function, eh, that the network could be a place to convene, as well as working on projects that can be implemented by members in their respective countries and jointly. So these were, according to the mapping, possible roles and functions. With regard to the animal's engagement towards the network, that's also a question we ask, and what do we see? That there is a good spirit in terms uh, of trust and cooperation, and that engagement is medium. It's not low, it's not high, <laughs> it's medium. And where the medium comes from has a lot to do that, um, with the fact that uh, members seem to be afraid that they will have to engage in something that will not help their national work. So it's something we need to think about that. Um, about the existing level of connection, we already talked about it, that there are limited linkages and that uh, out of the mapping we saw it was being said that relationships need to be strengthened at different levels in order to develop effective collaborative initiatives. There is a need of reinforcing mutual knowledge and interaction among the members and at the same time it might be necessary to consider an expansion of the regional network. Um, almost there, almost there. Okay, so um, the type of some relevant elements that can be useful for development and maintenance of the network. This is about processes of how you can start thinking about uh, a new network. 
The context analysis is key to ensuring agreement on the relevance of the network's goals. The social political environment where an OS Act is important. And we have already done a little bit this exercise in the beginning of the consultation, if you remember. The appropriate scale of the network. MOS preferences with regard to geographical areas have been mentioned before. Strengthening national activities before considering regional cooperation can be of real benefit to Pax Kisi. Uh, members and sections. Some comments from members indicate that regionalization in the form of networking may take place at the expense of overlooking individual countries and civil society organizations. That answer came up um, several times. What, what concerning the geographical scale, most act at the local province and national level. Asia Pacific members' preeminence at the local scale can be considered a virtue to be strengthened and a source of learning and benefit for the Pax network. When we look at membership composition, survey results show a diverse range of members and sections in the Pacific in terms of scale of action, capacity, resources, and this diversity is perceived as mostly positive by the members themselves, but it can be a burden when there is a need to aggregate the preference of members in order to define common goals. With regard to collective and individual members' interests, networks are collective efforts towards a common goal, but they also provide benefits to their members from an individual perspective. Members' interests should be an explicit driving factor for the network, otherwise it will become in, not at all influential, it will remain hidden. I think that's a very important element. Um, I think I'm always... Yeah, this will be the last slide. Concerning values. Common values provide a basis for common identity, necessary for confirmation of the network and for an affirmation of collective solidarity. I think we all know that. And we know that there are already common values uh, among all of you. Trust, one central element of relationship needs for a network is trust among its members and out of the mapping it showed that there is trust among the members. And then the promotion of exchanges, joint training or information sharing projects, these may eventually, eventually constitute the ground for a more structured network to develop. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Grant. And I would just invite any questions uh, for clarification or brief comments. We won't take a long time to open a lot of information up, but just if you have some specific questions, please feel free. Okay. Clear enough? Hello. Yes, Wish yes. Oh, we have two questions. Wish Brett, you mentioned about the danger of regional uh, network and to lose the local or national group. Can you elaborate more on what is this? Is there in terms of the issues they are bringing it from the national level or any other? Yes. Well, it might be that a network, um, in order to be able to function, might identify a certain team or an issue or a way of working which doesn't fit very well the local situation of a member organization. And these, if you want to work as a network, you need to make some choices. And that can be maybe um, negatively perceived if you want to work in a national or in a very local context that the choice you have made on the network level doesn't really fit what you do on the local level. So, um, is that okay? Yes. Do you have a question? Uh, anyway, my question is, when was this conducted? This survey? In uh, 2015 and 16. Uh, 16, the result was being published. Uh, all through 2015. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, mm -hmm. we'll have our own dialogue maybe later because I feel the burden, I'm carrying the burden of my group in Negros and I think this is maybe some kind of, we'll have some kind of separate sharing with the guys. Yes. Yes. yes.
Now we, we have been members, uh, like affiliated members, uh, uh, for the last, I think, uh, 16, yes, 17 years. So, uh, what is the process of uh, becoming a member? You mean the process of becoming a new member? Uh, no, yeah, no, you were saying We are just affiliated members. Who is it winning from affiliated Well, um, mm. The membership is all or if you if you mean formal, you mean by having voting votes. Is that what you mean by formal? Because the three types of membership are according to us formal members, only that there is a difference of rights. The sections have a right of voting and go to the General Assembly and whatever. An affiliate member has a right to think about strategies. Uh, for instance, here in the Asia Pacific reality. You're all involved in thinking about strategies, how we're going to develop the network. So that's a kind of a right affiliated members have, but there is no actually voting right. You're not represented in the General Assembly. You're represented by the sections, like the Philippines. So that's... Um, now the, the procedure of becoming a member or a section is, is a bit different. And that's a long explanation. <laughs> Maybe just one small addition to that is that one, one of the challenges that has been uh, on the table for Pax Christi International over a number of years has been the challenge of respecting the identity of affiliated member organizations, um, leaving open the space for organizations to be themselves, and at the same time, um, in, engaging, creating space within Pax Christi to um, have ownership of the movement. So one new direction in which we're just beginning to think and move is to consider the possibility of regional sections of Pax Christi where there are a number of affiliated member organizations that might decide to come together to form a section in which case they would then together have voting rights in the general AGM and so on, and would help uh, some with bringing, uh, uh, giving more uh, rights and ownership to member or, uh, affiliated member organizations that really want to be part of this network. So it's a, it's a challenging balancing act. Okay. okay, so let us just move on to, um, uh, before we break for lunch, to a couple of of other questions. Um, the task for this particular um, hour is to consider the identity of Pax Christi in Asia Pacific. What we've done so far is we, we um, learned from each other who we are and what we do. We've heard in the last few days that, among other things, Pax Christi in Asia Pacific is shaped by the vision and values of indigenous cultures is accompanying and learning from marginalized communities, is ecumenical and interfaith, is cooperating regularly with other peace and justice movements, is educating, advocating, and giving witness in many different ways to peace and justice, is working for integral peace as interconnected with ecological integrity and with social and economic justice. That's, I'm not pretending that that's a complete list, but those were some of the characteristics that really stood out for me in, uh, in what you were uh, sharing in the last few days. Um, you've heard a brief report from Great about the, some of the results of the very complex mapping exercise that we all went through a few years ago. We've shared a conflict analysis, we've imagined peace, and we acknowledged some of the roadblocks to peace that are still sitting there. Uh, over the last few days, in very more specific ways in a number of panels, we've explored different approaches to building peace on the ground, some best practices, if you will, nurturing indigenous spirituality, challenging affluence and overcoming poverty, living in harmony with the earth, combating climate change, and ensuring sustainable use of natural resources, 
promoting peaceful societies toward a world without war this morning, and promoting gender equality and human rights for all. That was a, a major effort to just uh, remind ourselves of the expertise and the work that is already ongoing in Asia Pacific in, in all of these areas. So, as we know, as we've said many times, the life of our movement is local and regional. But the results of the discernment and mapping process that Greg was just described, uh, has just described for us reaffirmed for us that there are real advantages to being connected and identifiable in many circumstances as Pax Christi. Our task in the next, it's not an hour, it's more like a half an hour now, is to think together about what that does or could look like in Asia Pacific. So the first, first question is what does it look like? And the second question that will continue into our conversation tomorrow for sure is what could it look like? So the question for you to consider, and I'm going to suggest that um, we begin by taking a little time yourself, five minutes, maybe 10, to um, answer these questions for yourself and then just to have a conversation at your table, either with the whole table or with uh, two or three, uh, uh, one or two other people close by. So the question is, how do we identify, how do we define the identity of Pax Christi in the Asia Pacific region? How can the Pax Christi movement help further in building sustainable peace in the region? You're all here because you are Pax Christi. You are the Pax Christi movement in this part of the world. And so we, how this question is answered and where we go with the conversation is really up to you for Asia Pacific. So I'm asking you to specifically think about answers and maybe write them down to, to these questions. Is Pax Christi known in your local area or your country? And I was very struck by what I think is a consciousness um, that we all have, that there are some situations where that can be very helpful and advantageous, and there may be situations where it is not helpful to, to uh, be identified with the name Pax Christi. It's just a, it's a question. In your local area or your country, is Pax Christi known? Second is, what difference does it make that you or your organization are part of an international movement called Pax Christi? Does that make a difference in your work, in your location? And then third, what difference could it make for Pax Christi to be a, a, a for, what, what difference could it make for Pax Christi's network in Asia Pacific to be perhaps strengthened or to be more visible? A really honest questions. So I would just invite you to take a few minutes to think about it on your own. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll bring a glass in um, maybe 10 minutes and then ask you to talk together about, about these questions. Um, when we come back, we won't have a lot of time to share, but we will have some time to um, just share what you've been talking about. Again, this is the sort of next step as we move into a conversation that will certainly continue tomorrow. But it would be helpful for us to have a shared sense of where are we now? And uh, what what might be the advantage of moving forward? So, any questions, Zach? Fair enough. Yes.